Hi guys, this is Yannick Goldenzen, and I'd like to introduce you to a new series, a new podcast series. Well, frankly, I don't know if it's going to be a series because this is the first video of this kind that I'm going to do. Let me just quickly explain the idea. It's a, a series, or maybe it's just going to be this one video, where I talk about topics and uh, my sometimes controversial uh, points of view when it comes to composing, uh, especially the soundtrack and m film music industry in general. And I'm just going to reflect on that. Please feel free to to comment, to like, to dislike, whatever you do. So uh, let's be a little bit interactive as well. And on that occasion now towards the end, I'd also like to thank you very much for being so supportive all throughout 2015. It's been really great and it's been such a fun ride together with you, that great community. Uh, you've been very active liking, commenting on my videos, which I always really appreciate and also always try to to answer and to write back as fast as I can and this makes my whole like composing journey much more worthwhile to share it with great people like you and so supportive people like you and I feel especially fortunate and blessed because I know and I see other people um, like in the internet can be such a destructive place and there's so many bad souls out there who just really like to slam creations of other people just you know you know that whole internet thing there's so much anonymous force i'm sorry for talking about the force i just saw star wars last night um there's such a destructive energy around in the internet uh because everyone can can make bad other people's work uh, like anonymously and uh, take advantage of that but i felt like except some some minor exceptions uh, it was really great and, and really a productive atmosphere, which which makes it much better for me. Now, uh, this series, if it's going to be a series, is going to be called Reflecting On. And in the first episode, I'm going to talk about digital libraries, the evolution of digital libraries, as well as the so-called markups, uh, a word that I absolutely hate, but uh, I'm going to talk about that later in this podcast. Now, first of all, um, to go back in time, I started to compose music uh, sh roughly after 2000, so after the millennium. And I remember back in that day when I started to compose, I was still using, or the vast majority of composers were still using those MIDI sounds that you know, for example, from the Nintendo 64. And so it was not possible to make like realistic sounding music because it was MIDI sounds. And I remember the, when the first real libraries came out, I think the first orchestral library I got was from East West Orchestral Library Gold or something it was called. And that allowed you to get closer to an actual orchestral recording. You will still be able to tell that it's fake because the technology was not that advanced that you could make like hyper-realistic music. Uh, of course, the whole industry changed over the years and... and I've been witness of that progression and that evolution of these instruments. And the point where we are today is absolutely exceptional, let me tell you that. I mean, today you can make music that is so incredibly accurate and feels realistic. Uh, it's almost too much to believe in, and let alone having that notion like 15 years ago was simply impossible. Anyway, that's basically what I've been up to the last 15 years was really a, apart from composing music itself. It was really to find the possibilities as well as the limitations of digital libraries. I mean, digital libraries are incredibly powerful, of course, but they have limitations. Usually you can't always do everything you want. I mean, like I said, digital libraries are all about finding the limitations. So sometimes I have an idea, for example, when I compose a piece, I know I would like uh, a, a trumpet section to play a certain melody. And then I construct, I compose, I arrange the song, and then I record the trumpets. And I just, with all tweaking and all with all the knowledge of how that works, it still does not sound realistic. Now the problem is, or what 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 is the solution? Is always the question. Uh, you have various possibilities. You can double it up with, let's say, strings, uh, violins, for example. You can double it up with flutes, and maybe that way you can like disguise uh, the trumpets a little bit or in the end maybe you'll find yourself in the situation that it won't work at all and then you have to be resourceful and just go like okay it does not work i have to do it another way maybe have the main theme so to speak played by the strings because like i said 
digital instruments are very advanced these days, but still you have limitations. I mean, that's out of the question. And another thing is, I think it is something you really have to invest your time in. Uh, if someone approaches me and, and says like, oh, how do you achieve that sound? And so it's, it's been years and years of hard work. I mean, I'm an absolute music fanatic. I love to listen to music as much as I can and all the way, you know, like uh, orchestra, classical music, blues, rock and roll, pop music, even rap music, uh, earlier stuff, 80s music, whatever, you name it. And like half of the time, I really just do it for my enjoyment. And half of the time, I really analyze it. And especially orchestral recordings, I've been analyzing and studying it so much the last 15 years, like uh, in which frequencies do the instruments play? How do they sound in a room? Where are they placed in a room? How much hole and reverb is there? Uh, how do they react to the other instruments? That, there are so many things to be taken in consideration when you do like orchestral stuff. It's it's almost it's too much to explain. And like I said, in the end, you really wind up in a situation where you say, um, "Okay, what am I going to do?" Because and that's something that I have observed, especially in the time where I was doing a lot of bond music. Now, bond music is great and really bad uh, at at once. The problem is. The, t the, the people's taste in Bond music is so different. I mean, some people like John Barry, some people prefer David Arnold, other people uh, love what Eric Serra has done with Goldeneye, other people love Bill Conti. So the taste in Bond music is really different and it's impossible to please everyone. And in Bond music especially, but also music in general, I sometimes I have the feeling that people don't take you seriously when you do these mock-ups. Now, let me explain why I hate the word mock-up. Mock-up sounds like, of course, what you do when, you, when you're creating stuff with digital libraries, what you do is make believe. You try to sell your music as being played by real musicians. You want it to sound authentic. You don't want people to go like, oh, this is absolutely, this is clearly a digital production. You don't want to have that. I mean, of course, we composers, we all would like to have the London Symphony Orchestra. We'd all love to have an 80, 90 piece orchestra and to record our music with that. But it's simply a, a question of money. Of course, it is. And I also understand that some people are like, okay, someone releases, or I, me in my case, I release an orchestral album and people just see me in a picture and they know, okay, it's been this guy and that computer and a whole orchestra comes out of there. I mean, seriously, that's a joke. That can never work. I sort of, I think if I would be the listener and just a consumer of music, maybe I would be the same kind of guy and, and go like, yeah, I mean, how authentic and how good could that possibly be? One guy with one computer, how good can that music be, especially if he wants to fake a whole orchestra? And that's like I said, but it's the same like with movies. It's make-believe. And I think it depends on the listener. When I, I'm, I'm an absolute movie freak and fan of 80s and 90s movies and but if you look at 80s movies i love those movies this they have i love those movies they have such a charm but if you would be looking out for it there's so many things you could criticize i mean there were blatant green screen effects uh really bad computer effects there were like really bad practical effects sometimes that you could clearly tell that it's an effect and it's not part of the movie actually or like great huge sets and if the pan if the camera pans a few millimeters to the right or to the left you can see that it's all cardboard cutouts and all that stuff but to me that doesn't matter because I don't want to be a wise ass and nitpicking and go like oh this this feels wrong and this looks bad and this doesn't look real I want to be taken on a journey and I want to enjoy the movie as an experience and I want to be part of that world that's why I love 80s and 90s movies so much and for me, it's the same about the music. My job as a composer, or in general, the composer's job is to sell the music as good as he can. Me personally, I, when I compose a track, orchestra, let's stick with the orchestra. My job is to make it sound as real as I can, as realistic as I can. There must not be one instrument or one second of a sample that gives it away that it's digital. And to me, always the biggest compliment is when people actually start to doubt and ask me 
if it's an, a, an actual orchestra recording or if it's partially an orchestral recording or if it's computer made, then I know I did a good job. And now if you want to be, a, a, you know, like a wise ass and go like, oh, I can, I can tell that this is, this is digitally made and I know this guy does not has an orchestra. Uh, of course, you can go like that. But to me, it, also, it always is about the perception of the listener. Is he willing to just enjoy the right and enjoy the music? And I think a lot of composers, also freelance composers and composers who are just starting out, do a great job these days. I mean, like I said, the digital libraries and digital orchestras have advanced. They can sound realistic if you know how to use them. You cannot download it and have no knowledge and just think you can like go ahead and just load an instrument load a trumpet section and it's going to sound hyper realistic just out of nothing it still takes a lot of work and knowledge to make it sound good and how to compose but i think a lot of composers do a great job with that and i don't want this to sound like self-defense but it's just to give you an understanding of how this works i mean usually you have to understand when someone does an orchestral album or an orchestral soundtrack you just have to realize how many people are involved in that production. I mean, the countless musicians already, 60, 70, 80 people sitting in the orchestra. Then you have uh, the composer. Then maybe you have an orchestrator, an arranger, a copyist who uh, makes the copies for the whole orchestra. Then maybe you have a conductor if the composer does not do it himself. Then you have a recording engineer, you have a sound engineer, you have someone who takes care of the mastering, the mixing, and all of that stuff. I mean, there are like really more than 100 people involved to make an orchestral soundtrack album. And now you are here sitting by yourself. You have to take care of all of that by yourself. You have to orchestrate for the whole digital orchestra. You have to know you know you don't have instruments that you can place in the room and they sound good because they're actual uh, instruments you have to place them digitally you know how how they have to sound and you have to really sell it then you have to make a good mix and mastering just so it sounds okay and up to the standard of course you're taking the shortcut in some processes because you play the notes and you don't have to have copyists and you don't have to have people who give the copies to all the musicians and all that but still it's a tremendous amount of work that you put into every second of music. And I think especially people who are kind of biased against uh, mock-ups or digital music really have to take that in consideration and appreciate for what it is. I think it's, it's not completely there yet. It's not completely accepted by the majority of music listeners. But I think digital recordings are going to be the future. It's going to be an art form of itself because programming and making digital instruments sound realistic is really an art form itself because you know you cannot rely on, on, an, on, the, on a professional musician actual being recorded in the end. You, ha you know everything I compose and everything I put together has to sound realistic in the end because uh, the, the person who's going to listen to my music does not care how labor intense it is to make a digital orchestra sound good and how much work and knowledge it takes to make it sound good. They just want to have it as good as it can be and they just want to enjoy it. And of course, if you compare two pieces, an actual orchestra recording and a digital orchestra recording, you can tell that it's not the same because even in 20, 30 years when digital libraries are really that advanced, that they are really easy to use and really sound outstanding. You can never transport the gravitas and simply the weight and the power of 60, 70 instruments and all the details and everything and all the human factor. I mean, like I said before, we would all love to have a huge orchestra play our music or we would all love to have a band. And that's another point. Uh, some people ask me, well, if you do, for example, a band album, like, you know, standard band setup, drum, bass, guitar, piano, uh, like that. Why don't you take actual musicians? Now, I personally, I'm a fair guy. When I want to have musicians on board, I want to pay them because usually I work with professionals who make a living being musicians. And I want them to, to get the money they deserve because they're good, because they're professionals, because they live from it. And you're not going to debate with your plumber uh, if he can come and fix whatever and just do it for free. And that's why I want to pay them. But 
usually if you want to have a great recording and pay a good musician, like one instrument is going to cost you 100, 200, 300 uh, dollars, which is a lot of money. Sometimes I do it and I have some great connections and some great musicians I met over the years who, who whom I can fall back on and and uh, you know also make arrangements. But usually I pay them as well because, like I say, they deserve it and it's their their primary income. So I want them to to have the money. Now, but if you sometimes also I, you know I'm not a rich guy. I have to be resourceful. I have to spend two to three hundred dollars for one instrument for one track. Now compare that with buying, for example, a saxophone library. I spend the same amount of money, two, three hundred dollars, but I have the saxophone at my fingertips. I can make it sound the way I want. I can play what I want. Uh, I can go back and change notes if I don't like something. I don't have to worry about uh, the recording because knowing how to record an instrument is another art form itself. But I know when I use um, libraries, they already come recorded pretty well, and I don't have to worry about that. And so, instead of spending two to three hundred dollars on one instrument for one track, I spent the same amount of money and can use it on all my future productions. And I have it, and the same amount of money. It's not because I'm cheap, and it's not because I don't want to use real musicians, but it's all about being resourceful and using uh, the money the best way I can. And you must not forget, I'm not a huge popular artist who sells like hundreds, thousands of copies. So I don't make thousands of dollars out of an album. When I release a good album and it sells good, then I maybe it generates like three to four hundred dollars a year. And so you see, and the production of an album usually costs me like four to five, six hundred dollars. For, like I said, the musicians, when I have some on board, or at least also the mixing and mastering, when you want to do that professionally, it costs a certain amount of money. So uh, the production costs and what I get back usually doesn't match already, let alone of there's something left for me, for my work. But I'm okay with that. I love making music, so that's okay. But just to give you kind of a, you know, relation to that. Okay. I think that's it for this podcast. I hope you liked it, found something interesting. Uh, Like I said, comment, like, dislike, whatever. I'm looking forward to it. Take care. See you next time. Bye-bye.